Madam Chief Justice, Justices of the Supreme Court, good morning. I'm Benjamin Katz, appearing on behalf of the Appellant of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, if I may. As a threshold matter, I'd just like to start out by noting there is no argument that the trial court did not err in proceeding in a summary proceeding. I think Chaldon, the cases it cites, make clear that when a trial judge resorts to the testimony of other witnesses, a summary proceeding is precluded, and that is not our issue here in this case. The issue involves the waiver of any objection to the summary proceeding, and the application of 801.384a and 5A.18. And as this Court, I'm sure, is well aware, the statute indicates where one has no opportunity to object to a ruling at the time it is made, 801.384a excuses the failure to make a contemporaneous objection. Yes, Your Honor. Let me, as you know, we're very familiar with the statute. I just want to, let's in our minds go back to that courtroom. A non-lawyer witness is being led away after a diatribe from the trial judge, and is being led away in order to be incarcerated. After having simply said what we have to presume she thought was true, or she was alleging was true. There's been no proof one way or the other. Putting yourself into her shoes, what would you have said? What should she have said? What could she have said without fearing risking the additional wrath of the judge? I think the short answer to Your Honor's question is that there's nothing that she could have said without risk of further alienating the judge. And I think the statute contemplates that scenario. It is for that reason that the contemporaneous objection is excused by the statute. But the next question in the line of reasoning is what does that mean for the later application of 5A18? You are excused from making the objection at the moment in time. But the jurisprudence and the rule makes clear that without some ruling by the trial court, there's no finding on that issue. And without a finding, there's no issue for appellate review. And how do we reconcile those twin principles? We're not going to punish a person who has no opportunity to object, and yet we still have to afford the trial court an opportunity. And I submit, as I've argued, you have to give the trial court an opportunity to make a ruling at a time when it can rectify the error. And here, counsel, the error is that her liberty was taken away instantly. So if the rule and the statute do not require her to make a contemporaneous objection, and I agree, they don't, if she had made an objection the following morning after consulting counsel, the error couldn't be rectified because the error was already done and over. She had lost her liberty for several hours. So then, what does it matter? And I understand Your Honor's point, and I think that was the opinion of the majority of the Court of Appeals. And I submit that consistent with Nussbaum, that is not the case. And I understand her liberty was taken immediately. But the issue is the finding of contempt, not the attendant punishment, but the finding. And the finding can be rectified. And I know that's small comfort to an individual who's hailed into jail, but it's not the punishment. It's the fact of the finding. And that is distinct from circumstances in which counsel is not allowed to make a proffer of evidence, or circumstances where counsel is not allowed or is not permitted an opportunity to object to inadmissible evidence or to object to improper argument. There, the window to rectify that is fleeting. But that's not the case with this objection to the finding of contempt. As Nussbaum makes clear, that was subject to later remedy by a later motion, a later objection. And I submit that is where the Court of Appeals erred. I understand Your Honor's perspective, but I would argue that this is a different animal. This is not an objection that had to be made at the time. And that's clear from the jurisprudence of Nussbaum. As I say, the Court of Appeals not only excused the contemporaneous objection, but it did not require any later effort to bring the matter to the trial court's attention. And I submit that was where it erred. Though a motion was made, no opportunity was given to the trial court to rule. The trial court did not rule. There is no ruling for appellate review. Well, let me ask you something. I mean, this is, she called it something else, but this was in essence a motion to reconsider what would be a final adjudication. 
by our rules, you're not entitled to a, mo- to a hearing on a motion to reconsider the final adjudication. Um, it's four something. I forget the rule number. But um, the judge can give you one, but you really can't just get it just because you want it. So how can, if we're going to apply this rule of you've got to get a ruling before you can come up on appeal, how are we going to, how can we do that when you can't um, necessarily get a ruling? You can't force the judge to rule. And I understand Your Honor's question, and I think I would, would argue by analogy in the context of the application of one colon one, it, it's often necessary to make clear to the trial court the dire circumstances for appellate review. It's necessary to ask the court to suspend its order so that it can consider the motion to vacate that you filed, the motion to set aside that you filed, to hold the running of the time and to obtain a ruling. And so perhaps we but, would require... But, but, but when you've... When you've got a um, motion to, to reconsider, and Brandon versus Cox makes it clear that you've got to at least be able to demonstrate that the trial court knew that the motion existed, that it was there. Um, once you've demonstrated that, if there's no ruling, why can't you just infer that that means it was denied, if nothing changed? I submit that, that that would be a reasonable proposal, but I think I would also argue under these facts it's not clear that this particular court was aware that that was I'm, I'm not saying that they were. I'm just asking you to talk about get a ruling. And I wanted to explore that. S- certainly, Your Honor. And I think to go one step further, if there is a paper trail of a motion to set aside as filed, and accompanying that motion is uh, an explanation, a brief in support that suggests time is running, time is of the essence, I need to obtain a ruling on this issue to preserve the appellate review, well, then you would be in an advantageous position on appellate review to suggest the court was, in fact, aware of all the circumstances. There would be quite a voluminous record demonstrating that these are the consequences I face if you don't issue a ruling. Uh, perhaps that would be one extreme, but I think what Your Honor has suggested would certainly be adequate. You could, you could reasonably infer from the state of the record that the trial court was aware of such a filing. Uh, and again, I would distinguish it from our facts, and particularly the circumstances of the simultaneous filing of the notice of appeal with the motion to set aside. I just want to ask you this. Under 5A18, could, could uh, an 8.01384 problem be the same thing as um, a good cause? I believe it is. I believe it's subsumed. The statute is subsumed by the exception of 5A18. Uh, and, and well, then if you, read it, if you read it that way, then it doesn't appear that you have to have given the trial court a chance to get it right under 5A18. Well, I think as the jurisprudence makes clear, uh, unless you give the trial court an opportunity, you you can, there's no issue for review. And there is a, a good cause exception to the application of 5A18, but I would submit that, that that exception would apply only where, because of the narrow window to affect a remedy, you couldn't later present it. I think that's how I would square the tension there that I think Your Honor has put your finger on. Well, I, count- I hope that answers your question. Your Honor. Well, counsel, um, in this particular case, uh, all of these events occurred prior to the decision in Brandon versus Cox. And in the decision, the opinion itself acknowledges that it was an issue of first impression as to what kind of, uh, that, that in fact filing with the clerk was not enough, that there had to be more. So under those circumstances, uh, would that, uh, would your, under these circumstances, would your answer to Justice Millett be different? Your Honor, I, I would acknowledge that Brandon did occur after these facts. Uh, but I would submit that it has long been the, the rule, the applicable rule, that without some ruling, there is nothing to review. And uh, I, I think it, it was well understood at this point that merely filing the motion did not obtain a ruling. Now, well, why, excuse me, why would the court have to then say, in its opinion, it's a matter of first impression? And secondly, uh, if you then are relying not on whether or not the court, what kind of information was before the court, uh, on the uh, rule of you have to have a ruling uh, before you can have a successful appeal, which is case law, or there's no statute, there's no rule that says that, doesn't that in effect eviscerate, eviscerate the entire statute that says you're not going to be prejudiced on appeal if you don't object? I mean, doesn't that make that meaningless? Because if you don't object, you're obviously not going to get some kind of ruling. Your Honor, to answer the second part of the question first, I think the 
the statute is not eviscerated because it, it excuses the absence of a contemporaneous objection. And the, the language of that statute in 801.384 in total talks about the prevention of waiver of issues for public review. And merely excusing the absence of, the, of, of a contemporaneous objection, it, it doesn't follow that we would then excuse uh, the absence of any later objection. But how could you have a ruling on a non-objection? How would you ever get a ruling on an issue that there was, wasn't ever brought to the court's attention by a contemporaneous ruling? And I believe that, that's my argument, that, that you can't simply sit on the power afforded by the statute. You can't say, well, I, I, I missed this opportunity. I'm going to rely on that forever. I mean, there must be some presentation to the trial court. But can our rules, 525 or uh, the uh, uh, Court of Appeals Rule 18, A18, 518, can, it, uh, can either of those override the statute? They cannot, but I don't believe I'm arguing for them to do so. I think I'm merely applying the statute, and what the statute says is that it will excuse a contemporaneous objection. And we know from prior jurisprudence that that is one and the same as a good cause exception to the application of the rule. And counsel, I, w- I would like to focus on the good cause exception. Because in, in all jurisprudence, there are cases that come along that are substantively different than everything that has preceded them. If a situation where a trial judge lost his temper, if a situation where a trial judge lost his temper, causing an unrepresented witness to lose her constitutional liberty in a gross fashion where no one subsequently has even attempted to defend the judge's action, if that doesn't come within good cause, what would? Your Honor, I I would submit the the existence of an opportunity to bring that error to the trial court's attention and failing to avail oneself of that opportunity is the difference maker. I agree in the abstract, in a vacuum, the facts that you have related alone clearly would be good cause. Assuming that the person never presented this opportunity to the trial court, there's an overriding presumption that appeals on undisclosed issues to trial courts should be avoided. And, and that's consistent with the statute. It's consistent with the jurisprudence in this area. And, and so what makes the good cause exception not apply under these facts is that there was an opportunity to bring what is very clearly error to the trial court's attention. And it was not taken advantage of. And so for that reason, the existence of that opportunity, good cause, does not apply in this case. Let me ask you this, counsel. Does 518 have a caveat that um, says, unless an objection was stated except for good cause shown, but you then have to file it as soon as you can? And get a ruling as soon as you can? There's nothing in there that says that, is it? You sort of, sort of, not made it up, but you've <laughs> grabbed it on. <laughs> I appreciate your honest perspective. <laughs> I think the jurisprudence makes clear, notwithstanding the plain language of these rules, what's at issue and the purpose of the rules, and, and I would point to Sheldon, and I think Brown is a case that, that talks about, you know, we want to avoid surprising trial courts. Right. And, and in a matter such as this, I mean, this is low-hanging fruit. This is clearly incorrect. And if brought to the trial court's attention in a, time, in a timely fashion, there's every likelihood that an appeal would have been avoided in this case. And, and that is the purpose of these rules. That is why we have waiver rules. Um, so what I'm suggesting is not in the plain language of the rule, but as applied by this court, by the Court of Appeals, it is clear you have to obtain a ruling by the trial court. Since, oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I've already asked a question. You have. Go ahead, Chief. I have, too. Go ahead. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, I mean, I thought you told me a minute ago that in the post, you know, uh, after final judgment, that you don't have to obtain a ruling, that you agreed with me that we can't require that. And you just said you've got to get a ruling. So where are, where are you? If, if, if I gave that impression, I did not mean to. I don't mean to concede that. You've asked, or at least as I understood your question, was well, how do we draft a policy that takes into account that it may be necessary to get a ruling, and how can we force the court to give us a ruling? 
that was the so, so are you saying that we still, we've got to, we've got to have a ruling even in this context? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Your Honor. And I think, as I made clear, if, if the record indicates the trial court was aware of what you were seeking a ruling on, I think you would be fine. And perhaps maybe I misstated that. Okay. I didn't state it artfully. But, but we either need a ruling or the record needs to be clear that the issue was before the trial court and for whatever reason the trial court refused to give a ruling. Okay. I want, I want to go back to something else that one of my colleagues asked to make sure I understand what you're saying. Under the statute, um, 384, it says if a party has no opportunity to object to a ruling order at the time it's made, if we were to say, well, okay, you didn't have time, you couldn't at the time it was made, and we all agree here that she couldn't, but you're saying, but she still had another opportunity, doesn't that alter the, the language of the statute? Because it very clearly says at the time it was made, the decision here was made the moment she was standing there. But you're, you're arguing that, well, she had an opportunity to come back and, and get the reconsideration. And I base that argument on this court's application of the law in Nussbaum because she, the, the failure to make the objection at the time is what is excused by the statute. You will not be prejudiced on appeal if you don't make it contemporaneously. You can make it later, and you can preserve it. But we're not going to hold it against you if you don't make it at the time. That is what I would submit is the purpose of that statute in the greater context of things that will prevent the waiver of appellate issues. Uh, and we have to balance that with the interest of you, you still have to afford the trial court an opportunity to rule on it. And in Nussbaum, the person, a lawyer, was found in contempt, was surprised, didn't make any argument about the appropriateness of the contempt at the time, but had opportunities to do so later. And the focus in Nussbaum was whether on those later opportunities they properly articulated the objection that they wanted to be considered on appeal. And so viewing the precedent of Nussbaum and applying the statute and the rule, I would submit Ms. Amos was required to do the same. But so, counsel, in Nussbaum, the attorney specifically said to the trial court over and over again, I am not asking you to rule on this. I am not asking you for a ruling on it. That's a little bit different factual situation that that was you must put into the play of the language of that opinion. And, and I, I acknowledge on brief that it was different. The facts are different, but I would argue that they are not materially distinguishable because the analysis of the court was still on this later occasion. Notwithstanding the lawyer's words, I'm not asking for a ruling, the analysis in Nussbaum was, did he, at this later juncture, present the issue that he now wants to present on appeal? And though the words that came out of his mouth were, I'm not asking for a ruling, the issue is the same. It is, we're going to excuse you're not doing it contemporaneously. Did you ever do it at a time when the trial court could act on it? And, and I would submit that the, that is the same scenario that is present here. And I understand Your Honor's distinction, and I acknowledge the facts are different, but I would argue they're not materially different. All right, thank you. May it please the court. Through all the levels of this case, the Commonwealth has never once tried to defend Ms. Amos' convictions on the merits. And that's because, as it admits, it cannot. It does not dispute that this court and the United States Supreme Court have both squarely held that what the circuit court did is explicitly forbidden. Instead, the Commonwealth's only argument for reversal is that Ms. Amos waived her right to appeal. But the en banc court of appeals was entitled to reach the merits and reverse her obviously unlawful conviction on two grounds. First, the court of appeals correctly found good cause to review Ms. Amos' claims because under section 8.01384A, she was denied an opportunity to object at the time she was summarily convicted and physically removed from the courtroom. Second, the ends of justice allow review here for three grounds. First, because the circuit court's order was void. Second, because it denied Ms. Amos' essential rights. And third, because she did not waive her Sixth Amendment right to counsel. First, the good cause exception. Section 8.01384 commands that if a party has no opportunity to object to a ruling or order at the time it is made, that absence of an objection shall not thereafter prejudice him on appeal. The plain text of that statute squarely covers Ms. Amos. The circuit judge unexpectedly summoned Ms. Amos to the podium, charged her with contempt, convicted her, and remanded her to jail, all without giving her the slightest opportunity to object. 
the Commonwealth makes no attempt to say that Ms. Amos could have objected at the time. Instead, the Commonwealth claims that Ms. Amos was required to file some later motion in order to preserve her claim. Well, she did, in fact, do that. She did. So, I mean, what makes this case different than Brandon v. Cox? We have argued that Brandon v. Cox is inapplicable on several grounds. Uh, first of all, I would note that here the Commonwealth has made much of the fact that she filed her notice of appeal and her post-conviction motion on the same day. However, Brandon v. Cox is not applicable to her claims. Uh, first, for example, it cannot be pl- applied retroactively to her. As was mentioned before, um, prior to Brandon, which was an issue of... Why can't it be applied retroactively? It's a procedural issue. Because under Bowie against the City of Columbia, a new and unforeseeable rule of criminal procedure cannot be applied retroactively on direct appeal. Here, this court had held in Marjorana against Crown Central Petroleum Corporation that filing a motion in the lower court would be sufficient to preserve a claim, even if the court had not ruled on it. But this isn't a rule of criminal procedure. This is a rule that applies across the board. It's not a criminal procedure. It is applicable, yes, Your Honor, to both civil and criminal cases. Well, is there, distinguish it on the facts. I mean, move, move on past the retroactivity question. How is it otherwise distinguishable from Brandon v. Cox? Here, it is also distinguishable because Ms. Amos, unlike Ms. Cox, was also denied her right to counsel. And as I had mentioned in my introduction... That has nothing to do with the waiver issue. I'm sorry, Your Honor? That, that doesn't have anything to do with the waiver issue. In this case, she did not waive her, her right to appeal because she filed the motion and she explicitly made her ruling known to the court. And as well, Your Honor mentioned... that's the problem, did she? I mean, Brandon v. Cox was all about the fact that that motion to reconsider was never... There's nothing in the record to know that the trial judge ever knew anything about it, that it existed. Aren't we in the very same posture here? No, Your Honor. Uh, here, the, the judge... The, what the judge did was certainly admissible from the... was certainly... Uh, transparent from the record. This is not a situation like in Brandon where there was simply no ruling for the circuit court to pass on. On the contrary, Ms. Amos' summary conviction is apparent from the face of the transcript, as is the fact that the Court of Appeals, I'm sorry, that the circuit court was obviously not empowered to make that sort of, to uh, to take that action. Rather, this this court's precedent makes clear that the court's actions were so obviously unlawful that they were void ab initio. That is what this court held in Casey against Anthony that the misuse of summary procedure, if sufficiently egregious, is enough to to render a court's order void so that it can be attached by any person, at any time, in any manner. And that is precisely what happened here, that the circuit court usurped all traditional understandings of American criminal procedure as laid forth in Skildoni and Oliver and summarily convicted her of a crime. As a result, her conviction is void and can be attacked at any time in this court. But, counsel, that's not an issue before us, is it? Yes, Your Honor, it is. It was raised in our opening brief, and the, whether the court's action were void can be raised at any time before any case. Nor has the, nor has the Commonwealth attempted to assert that the, order, that the issue was waived before this court. But it wasn't an assignment. You have no cross error that we're considering. Isn't that correct? I mean, the only issue is before us. I mean, I know you're saying you can raise it at any time, but you didn't raise it. You don't have it as a cross error issue or any other way that you normally... You're saying we can raise it when we file our briefs, when we make an oral argument. Any difficulty there, Your Honor, can be resolved by this court's decision just this October in Amon v. County of Henrico, in which this court found that as long as the appellant had raised one valid uh, assignment of error in order to give this court active jurisdiction, that this court was therefore entitled to reach the void ab initio doctrine. Here, the Commonwealth has made no claim that this court lacks active jurisdiction. In fact, the Commonwealth brought this appeal. And so here, under Amon, this court is therefore entitled to reach the fact that her conviction is void and can be challenged in this court. However, that is not the only reason which entitled the Court of Appeals to reach her claims. First, as discussed, is the, is the good cause exception. Because Ms. Amos was denied any chance to object at the time of the ruling or order, Section 8.01384 is pellucid 
that the absence of that objection shall not thereafter prejudice her on appeal. Well, we've got a lot of cases in different contexts that talk about you've got to give the, op- the trial court an opportunity to rule in a, t- in a timely manner so that if it's a problem that can be fixed, you make the objection known in time to fix it. Now, you know, there are a lot of instances where if you don't make the, you know, for like for the admission of evidence, if you don't make your objection then, then it's too late. Um, but in this context, when you've got a final judgment and you want the court to reconsider that, uh, it's not too late, in other words, to fix the problem. So we've got a lot of cases that talk about when you've got when it can be fixed and you do it in time for it to be fixed, you've got to give the court an opportunity to rule. So why wasn't that applicable here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we're not holding it against her. We're not holding it against her that she couldn't say anything at that moment in time. But there was an opportunity for her to go back to the court. That rule does not apply here, Your Honor, because... Of course, under Section 8.01, 384A, in the preceding clauses to what we are talking about here, it is, of course, true that one must make ordinarily your objection known to the trial court in order to give it a basis to rule upon. However, this next clause is an explicit exception to state that in the case where you were affirmatively prevented from objecting at the time, that the absence of an objection shall not thereafter prejudice you. Even if there's an opportunity thereafter to, to make your objection known in, in, in such time as it could be uh, alleviated, the problem could be rectified? The fact that Ms. Amos or any other person prevented from contemporaneously objecting could file a later from mo- motion for reconsideration does not mean that, she was, that they would be required to do so. Rather, Section 8.01, 384A speaks directly to that issue and makes clear that no such objection is required. The Commonwealth also attempts to assert the Nussbaum against Berlin controls this case, but it simply does not apply here. There, the contemnor, an attorney who had his own counsel, was given a chance to, to object contemporaneously, and he failed to use that chance. This court explicitly stated, therefore, that Nussbaum was not a case where Section 8.01, 384A might come into play because Nussbaum had and failed to use his chance to object at the, tw- at the time the order was made. By contrast, Ms. Amos, a pro se witness, was prevented from objecting when the circuit court summarily convicted of her crime and had her physically removed to jail. Nussbaum simply bears no resemblance to this case. Second, as mentioned before, Ms. Amos' conviction can be redressed by the ends of justice doctrine. I have already discussed the void ab initio doctrine, and whereas the fact that the court transcended all ordinary limits on procedure means the fact that it can and should be reversed on appeal. However, a second reason why the ends of justice apply is that Ms. Amos was denied essential rights. In Cooper against Commonwealth, for example, this court applied the essential rights doctrine to a defendant who was denied his right to counsel at the time a tape-recorded confession was obtained. If being denied your right to counsel during an interrogation counts as a denial of essential rights, then surely this case does as well. Do we apply the ends of justice exception in that case? Yes, Your Honor. It was applied sua sponte, um, and the court would be able to do so here, although, of course, Ms. Amos raised it. Ms. Amos was not only denied the right to counsel, as in Cooper. She was denied virtually every right a criminal defendant enjoys. She was denied her right to counsel, her right to notice, her right to respond to the evidence against her, her right to confront and impeach the evidence against her, and her right to obtain compulsory process in her defense. All of those rights have been described by the United States Supreme Court as fundamental, and every single one of those rights was denied by the trial court's error. Counsel, in the posture of the cases that is now, um, no one is challenging the Court of Appeals' opinion uh, reversing the, the, her conviction. So we have a situation where um, even if we were, if we agreed with you, we, we still wouldn't look at the, the uh, substantive issue because the Commonwealth didn't appeal that. They didn't appeal that conviction. So you've got a situation where your client is, has been declared by a ruling of an appellate court that is not subject to reversal that she's not guilty of contempt. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Certainly, the Commonwealth did not seek error on the ends of justice exception, but they did, however, brief it before this court, and so we have responded. 
I would further note that the Court of Appeals, of course, did not reach the ends of justice exception in the first instance precisely because it granted Ms. Amos relief under the good cause doctrine. On that ground, therefore, at a minimum, if this court were to reverse the en banc Court of Appeals on the good cause issue, it would be appropriate to remand to the Court of Appeals to consider that case in the first instance. Finally, a third reason why the ends of justice permits review is that Ms. Amos never knowingly waived her right to counsel. The Sixth Amendment has long imposed a demanding standard to prove that the right to counsel has been waived. Any waiver must be knowing, voluntary, and intelligent, and it must be proven by unequivocal evidence. This court so held in Church v. Commonwealth and in White v. Commonwealth. Here, Ms. Amos never knowingly waived her right to counsel. Indeed, the very reason that she could not object is that she lacked a lawyer who could help her preserve her claims. To sum up, the circuit court denied Ms. Amos essential rights, essential to the fairness of our criminal justice system. Ample grounds, as explained, existed for the Court of Appeals to reverse her unlawful conviction. Therefore, unless the court has any further questions, I respectfully request that the judgment be affirmed. Well, I have, I do have a question. In their second assignment of error, the Commonwealth asserts that the Court of Appeals has established a new rule of saying that you do not have to present the decision of a court in order to sustain your appeal, notwithstanding the statute. What is your position on the, on whether or not the court did that, and whether or not the statute can be superseded by that type of a rule? I would say, Your Honor, that the Court of Appeals did no such thing. It rather, it never purported to create a new rule of criminal procedure applicable to contempt cases. Rather, it simply interpreted the statute and the rule together, consistent with the plain meaning of each. Rule 5A.18, of course, does not define good cause, but Section 8.01.3.4a directly speaks to that issue and makes clear that good cause exists when a person is denied the chance to contemporaneously object. Once again, the Court of Appeals merely applied the two rules in conjunction. Besides, if there were a conflict between the statute and the rule, Article VI of this Commonwealth's Constitution makes clear that the statute would control. In fact, this Court has explicitly held, in Helms v. Manspile, I believe, that to the extent Section 8.01.3.4a and Rule 5A.18 conflict, the statute should control. So it's your position that you do not have to have a ruling of the Court in order to have an issue that is reviewable by this Court, a ruling from the trial court, in order to have that issue reviewed by the trial, by the appellate court? I would say first, Your Honor, that there is a ruling that this Court can review, again, because the conviction is obvious from the face of the record as for the reasons for that ruling and the fact that it is unlawful. However, yes, I would agree that in this unusual situation where a person is prevented from objecting, that yes, no later objection is required. That should not be unusual because in the ordinary course, even in a summary contempt conviction, the United States Supreme Court has made clear in Taylor v. Hayes that a contender should ordinarily be given the chance to speak before sentence is imposed. As long as that is done, then Rule 5A.18 should apply in the ordinary course. All right. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. You used all yours. Thank you. Thank you.